The next several weeks, we're going to be talking about what it means to walk with Jesus through this letter to the church in Colossae. And, and walking with Jesus is this lifelong journey of hearing and receiving the gospel over and over and over and over again. Now, Colossae is this small little town, and the gospel has penetrated there through, through a, a, a student of Paul. Paul never actually visited Colossae, but word of this church has gotten back to Paul. And this, this gospel has transformed members of this really small congregation so that they were growing rapidly in their faith in Christ, in their love for one another, and in their hope that they have for eternity. So today, as we take this first step in this walking with Christ in our new sermon series, we too pray that we will be transformed as we grow in our faith and hope and love. So today, I want to talk about three main points that, that Paul really emphasizes in this brief introductory portion of his letter to the church. The first is regarding reputation. Regarding reputation. The second part I'm going to talk about today is living this lifestyle of transformation. And then finally we'll wrap things up but by just discussing what it means to soak in the Spirit. So starting off first, the, regarding someone's reputation. Paul says, I've heard of your faith and of your love. Specifically, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Paul says we thank God for what he does, and we praise God for who he is. See, Paul thanks God for what God has accomplished in this church, namely the faith and hope and love of this congregation. Paul loves these three words, right? Faith, hope, and love. We hear them in, in 1 Corinthians 13, the, the faith and hope and love, but the greatest of these is, is love. Right? So these are familiar words in Paul's vernacular. And maybe they're words that we're comfortable saying, words that we say maybe pretty often, but maybe not words that we spend a whole lot of time thinking about the Lutheran question, well, what does this really mean? What is faith? What is hope? And what is love? These are aspects of the, the characteristics that's returned back to Paul, the reputation of the church in Colossae. Faith. What is faith? Specifically, faith in Jesus Christ. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the certainty of we do not see. It's a gift of the Holy Spirit. Faith is this, this working of the Holy Spirit through the word, what we've just heard, through the sacraments that we celebrate every other week, through the body and blood of Jesus, through the, the connecting with one another as we talk about our faith, through prayer. These are moments where the Holy Spirit promises to work and grow faith inside of us. Faith is not something that we do. Faith is a work of God inside of us. Faith is what allows us to receive the law of God and recognize how horrible we truly are. But faith is also that which allows us to embrace the gospel and hear of God's great love for us despite who we have been, despite who we are now, because he sees who he will make us be one day and who he declares us to be today, his beloved sons and daughters. Faith produces this intentional, unlimited amount of love that we have for God and it produces this incredible outpouring of love from us to one another. Faith allows that to happen. Love is, is maybe a little bit simpler. Now, love is this agape type of love. Agape love is not this infatuation love. It's not this lustful desire love. It's this sacrificial, all-encompassing, all-consuming love and passion that God has for us, his great sacrificial love to send his one and only son to suffer and die, to pay the price of our sin, to go to any length to bring us to be back with him in a right relationship. That's the love that he pours into our lives that then through faith we work into the lives of those around us. Love that, that doesn't seek to, to, to do anything so that we get something back in return. Love that's sacrificial. Love that is, is pouring out with expecting nothing back. This was the reputation of love that got back to Paul. What's our reputation like? Think about that. What is the, the reputation of St. Luke's Lutheran Church? What is the reputation? If you were to ask a random person who's not a part of our faith community and just ask them, Who do you, what do you know about St. Luke's? What would their response be? 
I think that gives us a, a challenge to consider that. If, if some delegate from here were to go off to Paul, what would they say about us? What would that news be? That's a tough one because it takes a whole lot of us all working together to, to be cooperating together, to pull all the, together in the same direction for a reputation to, to form and develop. But individually, who do people say you are? If you were to just have somebody randomly ask somebody else to say, tell you what do they know or think about you, what would they say? Or what would your reputation be like at home? What would your children say that you're like or your spouse say that you're like, if they're being honest? What about your coworkers? What is your reputation among your coworkers? Or how about this? This one might be even more difficult. What is your reputation around those who believe the exact opposite as you? Who look and sound and smell totally different? What is your reputation to them? Would it be, I don't agree with them, but that person is filled with love. Just let that sink in a little bit. What is your reputation? Not who you think you are, but how you're perceived by others. Now, Paul says expressly that this faith and this love, the way, that, the way that we have this, it happens as a result of the hope that we have. This hope. And I think sometimes we have a misunderstanding of that word. That, that this hope in this situation does not mean like, man, I hope that we get a nice sunny day today. Or I hope and just list your, your desires of your heart. That it may or it may not happen, but I hope so. If I were to ask you today, when you die, are you going to go to heaven? And if your answer is, I hope I've done enough, that's the wrong understanding of hope. Because when we put hope in ourselves and what we've done, man, we're hopeless. But if we put our hope in Christ and what he has done for us on the cross, and if I were to ask you, have you done enough to get to heaven? And you say, absolutely not. But Jesus did. Jesus did enough for me. Jesus' love is enough for me. Jesus' sacrifice is enough for me. That's the hope. The sure and certain hope. I stake my life on it because of what Jesus has done for me, because of who Jesus declares me to be as his forgiven, beloved son of God, who you are, his beloved sons and daughters of God. In that, you can have hope that never fails. Hope never fails. Paul wrote that, didn't he? If you, you rejoice in your suffering because suffering produces perseverance, perseverance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope never disappoints. And this hope that the church, this tiny church in Colossae, that word has spread back to Paul that they are filled with faith, they are filled with love, and they are filled with hope. And it's because of their hope that they have faith and love. We have hope in the gospel. And this week was a good exercise for our pastoral staff as we were talking through more of a full understanding of the gospel because sometimes I think the gospel can get limited down to just one single function, right? That Jesus Christ loved me so much that he came and died for me that I would live because he died. That I would die with him in my baptism and rise with him in his resurrection. And that's the end of the gospel. Now, there is 100% truth that that is a part of the gospel, right? That is a huge aspect of the gospel. That is the mission of the gospel is to save the world without a doubt, because it's only constant exposure to this gospel that saves that we understand that God loves us so much, that he wants to spend eternity with us so badly that he sent his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And faith comes by hearing that gospel over and over and over, and it's more than just mechanical listening to the audible sounds, but it's processing them, thinking about them. Scripture says, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them. It's not a race to get through devotion time. 
but like a delicate dessert to savor. Experiencing every aspect, every flavor. Now sometimes you can, I think you can sit in church your entire life and, and hear the sounds of the gospel over and over and over again and never really let it click. Never really get it. But sometimes that happens for most people in a time of crisis. Now, it doesn't have to be a tragic monumental crisis because the worst thing you've ever experienced is the worst thing you've ever experienced. So don't compare your crisis to somebody else. Your crisis is your crisis, whatever that may be, and it's hard. And it gets you to a place where you realize that you don't have enough. And when you're a bottom, the cliche, the only place you have to look is up. And you ask for help. And help the great rescuer comes rushing in. In those moments of crisis, when you recognize that you have nothing, you recognize that he has everything. He longs to give it to you. He longs to rescue you. In fact, he already has. He has rescued you by his grace. Now we have this gospel that saves. But there is more to the gospel than simple salvation. Because the gospel also, we have faith in a gospel that transforms Right? The gospel, when you hear it and you receive it, it's this authentic and life-transforming reality that you grab hold of, a worldview, glasses that you see the world through. This is a challenge to take an inventory of our own lives. How is God in the process of transforming us now? Maybe you think you've gone through a major life transformation and you are set on the road. That's not how this works. You may have had a big transformation in our set, but I want you to hear that God's intention is not that you are done. But you are continuing to be transformed by hearing the gospel over and over and over again, continuing to change and grow and develop in your discipleship. This is a cool thing about the word sanctification, a big church word that means you're set apart, you're holy, you're, you're, you're exactly how God wants you to be. And every single person in this room today is sanctified. You are holy, you are perfect, exactly the way you're supposed to be. But uh, Pastor Tag, I know my spouse is not. Well, here's how this word works. It's a now but not yet word. Jesus says, you are sanctified. You are exactly who I want you to be. Now I've declared that to you. Now go and live like it. But I can't. I want you to try. But I can't. I'm going to give you my spirit and empower you. But I can't. Try. And you do okay, and then you fail. And he dusts you off and said, that was so much better than last time. Try it again. Try it again. Try it again. And you constantly practice and develop and hone these skills of discipleship, and all of a sudden you look back and you realize, I've made progress, I've grown, God's been changing me. I know. It's a sanctification process. He declares you to be sanctified, and then he says, now go live like it. Practice this. I want you to develop this in your life. The gospel bears fruit as it grows. And we as believers need to allow the Holy Spirit to grow that fruit inside of us. Right? To... To, to accept and hear this good news that Jesus declares in our lives and grab hold of it, to not reject it, but allow the Spirit to infuse it into our souls and bring change to who we are. And it affects our minds, our emotions, our motivations, what the Bible calls the heart, the wellspring of life. Heart includes emotion, but is so much more than just emotion. It's an amalgamation of the inner drive that motivates our actions. And here at St. Luke's, we are praying that the Holy Spirit would come into our lives to awaken our hearts to the power of life in Christ. We've got the reputation. God, bring us transformation into our lives that as these changes happen, the outside world would see it and know it, that our reputation would grow to become more and more like you. Great, how do we have that happen? That's the third part. Take time to soak in the Spirit of God. This is not a rush job. This is not a halfway do it. This is take time, intentional time, to expose yourself to the Word of God, to just let the Holy Spirit flood into your daily life, not just your, 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 your Sunday morning life, but your daily life. This process of transformation is a long and gradual lifetime change. And because of that, Sometimes changes happen inside of us that don't show on the outside. And it can lead some people to say, well, I've gone through so much transformation and change, I want everybody else to experience that same thing and look around them and see friends and family who look very much the same. 
and bring judgment and condemnation on them or make them feel guilty under the guise of, I'm trying to motivate you to get better. Don't do that. Don't fall into that trap because you don't see what the Holy Spirit is chipping on inside their hearts. You don't see the growth and transformation that's happening on the inside. And someday, sure, that'll be visible. But don't downplay. Don't make them doubt. Don't make them think that God is not in their lives. Because you don't see what he's doing inside. God wants us to be concerned more about our own transformation. To focus on what he's doing in our lives. And let your reputation show. Let, let your reputation, not your words of judgment or resentment or, or encouragement even. Let your reputation lead that. Where are you bearing fruit? I love the fruit of the Spirit. I think that's a great way to start. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Which one of those do you want to see God work more in? Maybe you want to start off easy. Pick one that you're pretty good at and say, let's make this better. God, send your Holy Spirit. Let's grow more of this fruit in my life. Or maybe it's one that you really struggle with. Maybe you're a hothead with, with, a, with a bad temper. God, this is one of the worst, by the way, most difficult, not worst, most difficult prayers to pray. God, give me patience. Because he doesn't just give it patience, like hands it out. He gives you opportunities to be patient. But if you have a hot temper, then you deserve, your family deserves you to say, God, help me be patient. Help me show my family love instead of anger. Where are you bearing fruit? And then second, where are you growing? Where are you transforming? How do you, how do you reveal to, to those around you and your reputation that you are being transformed? You have a transformed life, a life of, of freedom, a life that knows that you are free from the law and free to live in the grace of God, that you have a life of joy, that you joyfully gather together with other believers and celebrate in worship and prayer and Bible study, that you enjoy a life of sacrifice. Not just service, but sacrifice that gives up your kingdom for the kingdom of God. That you give this life of renewal, that you constantly live in the grace of God, receiving the grace of God, the forgiveness of God, and generously giving grace and forgiveness out into the world. Share the stories of God's transforming power, because sometimes you can't see what's going on in the inside. You've got to vocalize it and share it with a story. Stories have incredible power. Stories show that whatever's behind the false veneer of social media that we like to show most people, get at the heart of what's really going on. Share stories that are real, that are vulnerable, that are relatable. See, sharing stories takes relationships to a whole new level. So much, so much more depth and meaning and transparency. It also invites people to share their own stories, further deepening that relationship. All of this being empowered by the Holy Spirit of God. Soaking in the Spirit. Now, more important than, than physical location, Paul does address this to the church of Colossae. But he incorporates this idea of a spiritual location. That they're not just located in this church. You are not just located here at St. Luke's in Central Florida. But you have a spiritual location. Your spiritual location is in Christ. In Christ. That's one of Paul's favorite phrases. He says this word, in Christ, 33 times in all of his epistles. And then he has this longer phrase that he says, in Christ Jesus our Lord. And he says that 44 times. This is one of his favorite expressions that we are spiritually located in God. That means he abides in us. We abide in him. We are the branches, we are the, the, the branches tied into his vine, tied into the Father, tied into the family of God. We are in him. That means his righteousness is laid over onto us. That when the father sees us, he sees the perfection of his son. That's what it means to be in Christ. The world put right. The kingdom of God. And in that, in soaking in the spirit, we receive peace and grace. Two other words that I think need unpacking today. Grace is the sense of Outward grace or favor or beauty or gift that's not deserved. See, grace is treating people better than they deserve. It, it sometimes is synonymous with forgiveness, like God gives you his forgiveness and grace, or because he's graceful, he gives you his forgiveness, and we put those two words together. But there's a far broader understanding of what grace is. Grace is absolutely everything that God gives to you that you do not deserve. Your daily bread, the home that you have, the clothes on your back, the car that you drive, the job that you have. We don't deserve any of that. He gives it to you 
freely. Grace. And then this peace. The sense of peace uh, is this Old Testament shalom kind of peace, this complete and total, everything's okay. Even though the circumstances around me may be so much less than what I want them to be, they're troubling, they're, they're disturbing, they're fearful, but I have peace. Because I know that my God is with me. He will never leave me or forsake me. He will empower me. He will carry me. He will be my God. And if he is for me, who can be against me? His Father is a source of grace and peace. And, and we, we have this peace now because of the grace that was given to us by Jesus Christ. He put us at peace with the Father. And I can promise you this. Even if the world is at war with you, if you are at peace with God, you will know peace that passes all understanding. And that peace for you was won by Jesus. Be filled with hope that hope in Christ, and let that hope in Christ encourage more growth of faith and love that you have for God and each other. Live a transformed life, not because you have to, but because the Holy Spirit is working inside you. And spend time to soak in the Spirit. Let's pray that right now. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would let your Holy Spirit overflow in this place that you would fill our hearts with your love. Right now, your love surrounds us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.